Well, I did forget two announcements that I should have made. One is from Jeanette Taylor. She says she will be going to St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville on Friday for a heart cath. Please keep her in your prayers. And also our brother Jerry Butcher will be having surgery, I believe it's tomorrow. Uh, so we need to remember Jerry in our prayers. Over the past several weeks, we have been looking at the Beatitudes of Jesus as he gives them in Matthew chapter 5. We have likened the Beatitudes, the first three of climbing the mountain, trying to understand, first of all, that one must be poor in spirit. In other words, remember that we must be ones who realize that we're spiritually bankrupt, that without God we are nothing. And then secondly, we looked at those who mourn, looking out and seeing the sad condition that sin has created in our world. We have deep sorrow for the state of mankind. In knowing that there will be few saved and many, the majority, who will be lost. And then we looked at the meek. The ones who are willing to humble themselves and to think less of themselves and more of others. And as we got to the top of the mountain, we understood that based on those first three thoughts, we realize that we have a need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. In other words, we must look into God's Word because His Word gives us all that pertains to life and to godliness. And so this morning we're going to start back down in the mountain and we're going to go down the other side. As we look at those who are merciful, as Brother Jonathan read for us this morning. When we look at that word and we see that Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Exactly what is Jesus stating when it relates to the word mercy? Throughout the New Testament, it is used really predominantly in two ways. But what I want to focus in on is it indicates to us today as an emotion of having compassion upon one who is unfortunate. The other meaning is that which deals with punishment. And how that the Lord is merciful to us when it comes to what we deserve, justice. But instead the Lord shows us mercy, leniency in what we truly deserve. Brother, understand that being merciful is not being blind to one another or to another's behavior. But what it is, is that some people today, and they go right over in the same reading of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to Matthew chapter 7. And they look at verse number 1 where it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Mercy does not include the aspect of no judging. Mercy says that we must judge with righteous judgment. Remembering as Jesus further states in Matthew chapter 7, that with what judgment we give, that is with the what judgment we will be judged. And so the idea that man has today, it's an unfortunate mindset that one must be free-minded that one should be able to do whatever he or she chooses to do. Many people in our world today think that a person who extends mercy is one who smiles at transgression. They smile at law breaking. Let me ask you a question. Doesn't that stand in contrast 
to the statement that Jesus made when He says, Blessed are those that mourn. If we accept the attitude that anything goes, and that what I say is right is right, and what you think is right may be right, doesn't that go against the command in this beatitude when Jesus says, Blessed are those that mourn. You see, you and I, as God's children, once we have learned how to be poor in spirit and ones who mourn and have learned the attribute of being meek, we understand more fully what it means when Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And what I want to do this morning as we look at this concept of mercy, I want to look at the Bible. And I don't have time this morning unless you want me to continue preaching until midnight. And then some of you will probably fall asleep and fall out of your pew. And remember, I don't have the power of the Holy Spirit like Paul did to raise you back up from the dead. So I'm going to just use a few passages that deal with this idea of mercy in the context of compassion. We know that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He was, in my opinion, and I hope you will share it with me, would you agree that He was the most merciful, compassionate man who has ever lived? And not only who has ever lived, but as we see the record of his life in the Gospels, would you agree with me that there will never be another one that's as merciful and as compassionate as Jesus? Let us turn, first of all, to Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18, as we begin reading in verse 21, Peter asked a question. He says, Lord... How many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? And Peter had a specific number in his mind, did he not? He says up to seven times. Remember, under the old law, that is what was quote unquote required. That you forgive him seven times. And if you sinned against you the eighth, I guess you just didn't forgive him. But Jesus looks and he replies, he says, no, not up to seven times, but up to 70 times. Brethren, when we understand the numerology of the Bible, we understand that seven is the completeness of God. So Jesus says we ought to go above and beyond the completeness of God and he uses a multiple of ten. In other words, what Jesus is telling us is the amount of times we forgive one another, the amount of times that we show mercy and compassion to one another is that time which is unlimited. We should always and I can't emphasize this enough. We should always have a heart that is willing to forgive. We have no choice when we realize where we were lost in sin. And we realize that the world is lost and dying in sin. And that we need to humble ourselves. Oh. Yes, I'm going back to the first three Beatitudes. Those are all learned things. So here it is that Peter says, how many times? Jesus says, up to 70 times. And I think Jesus is wise in the fact that he gives an example. We read down through here and we read of a gentleman who was unmerciful. You remember, he owed a debt 
that he would never be able to repay. The Bible says he owed 10,000 talents. Something that the master knew that he would not be able to repay. The master in verse 25 commands him to be sold with his wife and their children and all that he had so that the debt could be paid. But notice the reaction of this indebted servant. Verse 26 says, He fell down before the master, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. He fell down before the master, and what was he doing? He was begging the master to be merciful. I believe, whether you do or not, that's your choice. You have to decide for yourself. I truly believe that this servant that owed a debt, he knew that he would never be able to repay. And that's one reason that he fell down and he begged for compassion. He begged for mercy from this servant. Then look at verse 27. The master was what? What does it say? He was moved with compassion. In other words, this master saw that this man was truly wanting to do the right thing. And so the master had compassion. And he released the servant and he forgave him the debt. Now notice the other side. The first one, the master who forgave the debt is Jesus himself. It is God who sent Jesus to give his life a ransom for us. Remember, God shows us mercy by not giving us what we deserve. What do we deserve? Don't we deserve because of our sin, don't we deserve to be lost in an eternal fire? An eternal place of torment? Isn't that what we deserve? But the Bible says God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should what? It's the Bible say? Should be saved. That He should not perish. That's mercy. That's God showing compassion to us. We sing the song, He paid a debt that I cannot repay. The Master forgives as we are penitent. But then are y'all ready to read about us? So I said, Brother Ray, don't throw me under the bus like that. Are you ready to read about how we act? Because this unmerciful servant, the one who the master had forgiven, notice what he does. As soon as he walks out of the master's house, and that's the picture I paint, he sees a servant that owes him a debt. He owed him a hundred denarii. And what did he do? The Bible says he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. That is a threatening message. He says, pay me what you owe. You don't notice what the servant did? His fellow servant. Did he do do you remember what he did? He fell down just as the other one did. And he pled for compassion. He pled 
for patience that he would pay him back. But this unmerciful servant would not return the favor of mercy and compassion. Be sure your sin will find you out. Because as you read on, guess who saw what this servant did? The Bible says his fellow servant saw it. Which brings up an interesting point. How did they know that this servant who owed this outrageous amount that he would never be able to repay, how did they know that he had been given mercy and compassion and been forgiven of that large debt. How did they know? They didn't have the internet back then. They didn't even have phones back then, to my knowledge. How did word travel in the days that Jesus is giving this story? There was only one way that I know of, and that was by word of mouth. They may have seen this, perhaps they saw him come out of the master's house, knowing that the master had called him in. And when they saw the glee and the joyful look on his face, perhaps they knew that he had been forgiven of that myth. The Bible doesn't tell us. But somehow, some way, these individuals knew. And when they saw him treat his other fellow servant in a manner which was not consistent in the way he had been treated, they went. And they told the master. And then the master calls him back. Verse 32 says, You wicked servant. I forgave you all the debt that you begged because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Is that a reasonable question that should be asked? Brethren, when you and I truly hunger and thirst after righteousness, are we not going to want to share the message of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel? As the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. Why should we why should we not be willing to have compassion and mercy on those who we know are lost in sin? To me, that's what this parable, it's one of the things, I should say, that this parable is illustrating. God looked at us and he said, Yes, you are a wicked, you are an evil servant. I'm going to call you into account that you might give record of your life judgment. Let's go all the way back. I know y'all love me for doing this. But let's go all the way back to the Old Testament. And let's think about those who were held captive in the land of Egypt. Y'all, y'all, are you with me? You know where I'm going with this. Here they were, by their own choice, because of a famine, they chose to go down into the land of Egypt because Joseph had had the dream where they would have seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. They go back down to Egypt so that they might survive. But conditions in Egypt became so bad, they were so oppressed, that what did they do? 
they pled to the Father God to have mercy and compassion to deliver them from the hands of the Egyptians. What did God do? God called Moses, who said he could not do and fulfill the mission that God wanted him to fulfill, gave all those excuses. God answered every excuse. God had compassion on Moses. He showed Moses mercy when he provided an answer for every excuse. be able to go before Pharaoh and deliver the message of God, let my people go. <coughs> and we all know that Pharaoh immediately released the, the children of Israel, right? Is that, how, is that how it happened? No. God shows his compassion and his mercy through a series of events. Where he sends ten plagues to try to get the children of Israel to understand, the Hebrews at that time, to get them to understand who God is and what God is capable of doing. The tenth plague rolls around, and you remember they were told to take the blood and place it on the doorposts and on the lintel. And when God passed over the land, when he saw that, the Bible says that the death angel would pass over and spare the firstborn of that household. How long did it take? How long did it take for the Egyptians? Not the Egyptians, for the Hebrews. How long did it take for the Hebrews? To forget the compassion and the mercy of God who delivered them from the land. How long did it take? It was the very night that God delivered them. That they came to the edge of the Red Sea. And they forgot. so that we could die because there were not enough graves in the land of Egypt. They forgot the compassion and mercy that God showed. The Israelites were a forgetful people. I suggest to you today that we are really no different because we're a forgetful people too. Sometimes the Lord has a way of humbling us to get us to realize His mercy and His compassion. You don't believe me? Live through last week with me. Just live through it. I don't have to go into detail. But I stopped. And I had to think about God's mercy and compassion on my family. It's humbling. It caused me to realize where I had been and where I am. The unmerciful servant. Or, or maybe we need to go back over the, just go back to the same <laughs> And look at Matthew chapter 6 in verse 12. Jesus here in the model prayer and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here Jesus is giving us a basic principle that demonstrates mercy as God shows his mercy in forgiving us we ought to realize that we have others who we need to forgive. 
Or perhaps we need to go to the book of James, chapter 2. James chapter 2, and look at verse 13. It says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That passage is almost a direct reflection of the words of Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. On the other hand, the verse could say, the next verse could say, Cursed are the unmerciful, for they will not obtain mercy. On the judgment day, we will stand before God. And we will truly see with a greater appreciation of God's mercy and God's justice and His compassion towards us. Let's look at a few. Wow, time flies. I want to look at a couple of examples. First of all, think about the Good Samaritan. You remember the Good Samaritan, right? You remember, remember that story? There was a man who was traveling down the mountain and he fell among thieves and robbers and he was beaten almost to death. There were a priest and a Levite who were traveling down that same road and for whatever reason the Bible says they passed by on the other side. Did Jesus is giving this parable, remember, in response to the question, who is? Who is my neighbor? Who is my brother? Mike, I hadn't had time to go back and listen to your sermon, but I understand from a few people that what well, may have been one of the best sermons you've preached since I since I've been, since I've known you. As he covered the topic last week about being our brother's keeper. If you haven't, if you if you weren't here, it's on the church YouTube page. It, 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 it's stand alone. I'm going to go back and watch it this week to be encouraged. But here we see the good Samaritan. This man, a man from Samaria, the one who was hated by the Jews. He stops. He helps this man. He loads him up on his own donkey. He takes him to the inn. He pays the innkeeper. And he tells the innkeeper, if you incur any more expenses, you keep record of it, and I'll pay you when I travel back. And Jesus says to the man who questioned him, who was the one? Who was the neighbor? You realize the man couldn't utter the words, the Samaritan. What was his answer? What was his answer? His answer is, depending on which translation you read, some say the one who showed mercy. Other translations say the one who showed compassion. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Of course, no greater illustration than Jesus, right? There was no other great ones. All through the life of Christ, He shows us example after example after example of those who the religious leaders of His day considered to be outcasts. Whether they were sick, whether they were poor, whether they were maimed. Jesus reached out, showed mercy and compassion. How many of you remember a wee little man who climbed up into the sycamore tree? How many of y'all remember this little man? Not that little man, but the one in the Bible. 
I picture Zacchaeus as about being the size of Phoenix. And he has trouble seeing Jesus, but he wanted to see Jesus. He had a desire to see the one who he had obviously heard. The Bible says he climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Savior to see. What did Jesus do? Someone says, well, Brother Ray, are you that dumb that you don't, don't remember? Well, I remember. I want you to, to think about what he did. Jesus looks up in the tree and he sees Zacchaeus. And the words of Jesus, come down, come down, for I'm going to your house today. But Brother Ray, Zacchaeus was a low life. He was an outcast in the eyes of the Jews. Because he was a tax collector. He had sold his soul to the Roman government. And the Jews did not like him. Brother Galen. When Jesus looked up in that tree, that was the beginning of him showing mercy and compassion to Zacchaeus. His mercy and his compassion was fulfilled in the fact that he went home with Zacchaeus. And outcast. I still got seven, eight, nine, ten pages of notes about being worse. But I'm not going to cover all of them. I want to close with a poem. It says, Out of this life I shall never take things of silver and gold I make, and that I cherish and hoard away after I leave on earth must stay. Though I have told for a painting rare to hang on my wall, I must leave it there. Though I call it mine and I boast its worth, I must give it up when I quit the earth. All that I gather and all that I keep, I must leave behind when I fall asleep. And I wonder often what I shall own in that other life when I pass away. What shall they find and what shall they see in the soul that answers the call for me? Shall the great judge learn when my task is through that the spirit has gathered some riches too? Or shall it be, or shall at the last it be mine to find that all I had worked for I'd left behind? When it comes for our time to pass, what do you want to be remembered as? What do you want to be remembered for? I can think that I want to be remembered as being blessed because I was merciful. Knowing that I will receive mercy. In our life, in our time. Let's be careful. Let's not show the wrong kind of mercy, but let's show the mercy that is exemplified in God's Word. This morning we may have one who needs to respond to the Lord's invitation. Whatever your need may be, whether it's to put Christ on in baptism, because you know and you realize you're poor in spirit. And you look out and you're willing to mourn about the sinful condition of our world. And you're willing to humble yourselves. And you become one who will hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see the need to be merciful. Because our great example Christ showed it in every facet of his life. This morning... If you have not become a Christian, you can come 
and be baptized in the waters of baptism with the blood of Christ will wash away your sin. Or perhaps you've done that and your life hasn't been lived as it should be. And you want to start over again. You can come repenting of sin, confessing those sins. Will you let us pray with you, pray for you? Because we all want to get to heaven, don't we? And we all want to help each other get to heaven. That's our goal. This morning, if you had need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we pray you come while we stand and while we sing.